It says, now when Joshua was near Jericho, he was near the place that he had been eyeing for a long time. He was closer to his miracle than he'd ever been before. Some of you are closer than you've ever been before to your breakthrough. Now, when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and he saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and he asked, are you for us or for our enemies? Are you for us or are you for our enemies? And he said, neither. Who are you for? Who are you for? Joshua was about to find out this was God himself in the flesh revealing himself to him. This wasn't an angel. This was God. The commander of the armies of heaven had shown up to talk to Joshua. And Joshua's question was, who are you for? Are you for us or for them? Are you for Republicans or Democrats? Who are you for? And God says, neither. I'm not for any of your political games. I am for the kingdom of God coming to earth for such a time as this. He said, as the commander of the army of God, I have come. I've come for you, Joshua, and I've come to lead you into the promised land you've been waiting for. Now watch what happens. When Joshua encounters God, there's only one way to respond to God's presence. It says Joshua fell face down in verse 14. He fell face down. He gets down on his knees and he says, oh God, when you realize how great God is, you realize how small you are. And when you realize how small you are, you realize, Lord, I'm nothing without you. God, I need you. If we're going to win this year, it starts with surrender. Success starts with surrender. If you're going to succeed this year, the first point in this message is you've got to surrender. You've got to surrender. And listen, success starts in the secret place. Joshua was all by himself with God. It doesn't start in a church service. It starts when you get alone with God and you say, God, there's some big dreams I've got in my heart for this year. There's some things I need to do. I gotta, I gotta get healthy in this area. I wanna lose weight this year. I wanna, I wanna get stronger this year. I wanna get spiritually strong. I wanna read my Bible this year. Whatever your dreams are. And some of us have come into the room today or maybe watching online and we don't have a dream for this year. We don't have a goal. We don't have a prayer. And I believe in order for you to get the vision that God has for you, you've got to start with surrender. I can't get the assignment from God when I'm standing. I've got to get on my knees. That's where Joshua's at, saying, Lord, I need you. Lord, I need to hear your strategy. Lord, I need your vision for my life. Lord, I need to know what you want to do in me and through me. And the commander of the army of heaven says, take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy, is holy. You know, just a, a few months ago, I was in the worship center here and in the sanctuary and I come in here every week, a couple times a week, and I'll sit down on the piano, and I'll pray over the seats in the room, and then I'll come up to the stage, and, and I'll just pray, I'll just worship. And, um, and it was the week of the election. It was, it was November 4th, or whatever that date was, November 5th. And there was a lot of chaos. It seemed like nobody knew what was going on. Nobody knew who was elected. Maybe you're still not sure who's elected, I don't know. But no matter, listen, let me just say this. We're gonna pray for President Biden and, and Vice President Harris because I believe they need our prayers. And I believe our nation needs our prayers. But when I was sitting in the room and I was just kind of watching the news, I was thinking, man, why waste my energy on the news when I can spend that energy in his presence? And I sat down and I just started writing on the piano. And the words just started coming to me um, he's still faithful he's still in control and I sang that because I was thinking you know no matter who's in office no matter what happens here I've got to remember my hope is not in a politician my hope is in is in God and 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 his faithfulness is not unstable it's not insecure and then I wrote um, he's still able he's still God alone his kingdom can't be shaken or overthrown. He's still good. He's still God. He's still holy. And he's still on the throne. And I was just singing those words over and over in here. And I got lost in the presence of God. I just started crying because I was thinking, you know, there was so much going on in the news during that time. Uh, even, even just pastors and leaders who were having 
moral failures. And I was thinking, you know, sometimes we put our faith in a person. People idolize pastors. They idolize politicians. And God says, I will have no other God before me. No, no other God before God. No, no president before God. And I was thinking, you know, when man fails us, because man will fail us, no matter how perfect a man looks, we're flawed. That's why we should never put a man on a pedestal. No matter how good he looks or how, how good he appears, there's only one good teacher, one good father, and he's still on the throne. And so I wrote those words, um, he's still good, he's still God, he's still holy, even when others aren't. He's still good, he's still God, he's still holy, and he's still on the throne. When my life feels like it's sinking sand, on Christ the solid rock, I know I can stand. When troubles come, Jesus, you'll never leave. Though all may run, my God, you're there for me. That, that lyric right there, when I wrote that, um, I was thinking we were catching a lot of heat for being open as a church, and people were, you know, threatening us, and I, we were on the news uh, <laughs> during, during 2020 a lot. Sometimes good, and sometimes it wasn't the best, best news to be on. And um, I was thinking, Lord, if everybody left, you're still there. You're still there. And that, that's when I wrote that, those words. And I, I was even talking with a guy who just walked through a divorce. And he said, you know, I felt like, I felt like everybody left but God. Though all may run, my God, you're there for me. You're still faithful. You're still in control. You're still able. He's able to heal you. You still got a load. Your kingdom can't be shaken or overthrown. You're still good. You're still God. You're still holy and still on the throne. And then I wrote this part because I was starting to get anxious in November, December. Even, even last week, I was starting to get anxious about the future and and that's where I came to these lyrics right here. Um, I don't know what tomorrow holds, but I know who holds tomorrow. And that's you, Lord. With every sunrise, I can feel your grace. When seasons change, I know you love remains. You could also say, when presidents change, I know you're still the same. And then I was writing this, this bridge here. Come on, y'all should loosen up. Aren't you thankful that God's like unchanging? His love is amazing. No matter what laws are passed or what's going on, He's still on the throne. And, and I was riding the bridge, and I wrote like a 10-minute long bridge, and they were like, we're going to have to shorten this because people won't download this song if it's 20 minutes long. <laughs> and so, uh, so I just started writing. I said, I, you know, I just feel like we've got a shout. And I was talking with Sam and Daniel on our worship team. I said, I feel like we got a shout. He's still on the throne. But we're going to shout it after every little line that we say here. And so I, I started this part right here. And I need your help this morning. Can you guys sing it with me? All right, so when it gets to still on the throne, y'all sing out. I got to remember the beginning. Oh, yeah. People come and go. How many of you have seen some people come and go in your life? Yeah. When you grow up in Victory Church your whole life, you see people come and go. And um, I remember even when my dad passed, people who had been with me for a long time left. And, and it was hurting. It was causing me so much pain. And then I came back to, yeah, but God's still with me. He's still on the throne. And when, when, when it's you and God, you and God are the majority. When you got God with you, you're going to win. If you, if you surrender to God, it doesn't matter who leaves or who comes. You're going to make it. Let me try that again. People come and go. 
Nations rise and fall. Kings and crowns will fade. Even in the USA. When I have to change dirty diapers. When my kids talk back to me. Through sickness and disease. Through the good, the bad, and the ugly. You get the point. He's still on the throne. Come on, give God praise. He's still on the throne. I got, I got the jacket on today. He's still on the throne. But here's the point. Joshua could not conquer Jericho unless he secured the fact that God was sitting on the throne of his heart. You cannot conquer the addictions. You cannot start the things you need to start, stop the habits you need to stop. You cannot walk in victory until you start with surrender. Joshua had to say, Lord, sit on the throne of my heart. And whatever your strategy looks like, no matter how silly it seems in the eyes of people, if you want me to march around the walls of Jericho day after day after day, I'll do it. It starts with surrender. And, and I love in Exodus 33, 11, Moses was going to hear from God. And before Moses would lead the Israelites, he would spend time in God's presence. By the way, the strategy comes from the secret place. If you're going to get a strategy for this year, it starts with spending time in God's presence. A lot of the sermons that I write, the songs I write, come from times where I'm just sitting in the room with no one here and just praying and asking God, God, what are you speaking? A lot of the ideas, that they just come from that place of surrender. So Moses in Exodus 33, 11 would go into the tent of tabernacle. That was the presence of God. He would get the, the strategy, but then it says he would leave. And guess who would stay? Joshua the son of none. You might be the son of a father who left you, but you have a father who cares deeply about you. Joshua was the son of none, but he was the son of God. He was a child of God. He was a child of God's kingdom, and he, he would spend time in the presence of God. Why? Because he was waiting to get the vision for his life, and it was in that secret place. I think Jericho was birthed, not in Joshua chapter 6, but in Exodus 33. It was in Exodus 33 that Joshua got the vision for Joshua chapter 6. I wouldn't be standing here preaching to you today had I not spent time in college when I was at Oral Roberts University, working as a janitor, picking up nachos for people, dreaming in the baseball stadium at midnight after baseball games, picking up people's trash, praying about one day leading a church, and I didn't know it would be victory. I thought I would serve my dad and he would send me out to go and minister somewhere else, but I'm telling you, the vision came in the secret place. That the birthing of Jericho started there. It starts with surrender. I was talking with my son, Liam. He's seven years old, and he was, every day we, when I drive him to school, he's got about 100 questions for me. And, and so, you know, he asked me everything. He was asking me the other day, where does water come from? How do we get water in our house? How did the water get inside the tubes? Where did it get, did we bring it from the ocean? How did we pull it? What, what kind of tubes did we use? And I'm trying to think through, and I said, you know, Liam, I don't have the answers to every question. He said, well, who does? <laughs> I said, I don't know. I said, sometimes we don't need to know all the answers. And he said, why? <laughs> I was like, Liam, because that's why, because that's why. And he's like, well, that doesn't make sense. You know, Liam, Liam likes to reason and logic. That's how we are with God sometimes. God, I don't understand. Why would you want me to do this? Why would you want me to give in the offering if I'm supposed to save money this year and, and walk in? Because oftentimes the things God's asking us to do that don't make sense to our logical mind make sense in a spiritual way. And sometimes we, we, we underestimate those things that, the Bible says God's ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are deeper than our, what God's doing in America, what God's doing in the world right now, even with COVID-19, we don't understand it right now, but 20 years down the road, we'll look back and we'll go, that's what God was doing. He was preparing the church for revival. He was getting the church ready to shift from old models, to get out of stale traditions, to get ready for a fresh wind and a fresh fire. Now we get it. We don't understand understand it all. But faith begins where understanding ends. I'll say that again because it rhymes. Faith begins where my understanding ends. And I told Liam, I said, 
you have to receive, you have to understand that not everything can be answered. And if you're searching your whole life to try to get the answer to every single question, you're going to be a very miserable, confused person. And he was like, why? <laughs> he accepted it. He accepted it. But we've got to get to that place of surrender. So Joshua is at this place of surrender. God says, take off your sandals. It's holy ground. And then he says this. Now, the gates of Jericho were securely barred because the Israelites, no one could come in. No one could go out. So he's describing the situation. If I could describe the thing that you're facing right now, maybe it sounds like Jericho. Maybe for you this year, you're saying, I, I, I've got to break some bad habits in my life. And these bad habits, they're so thick. They've been building over time. The walls of Jericho were not built overnight. It happened time after time. Because the longer you practice something, the more it becomes a wall in your life. And brick by brick, you've built up this addiction. And it's so thick. The walls of Jericho were so strong, it was impenetrable. For some of you in the room, you go, Paul, I don't know how I could break down these walls because they've been built up for generations. My grandpa was addicted to this. My dad was addicted to this. I'm addicted to this. The same God who brought down the walls of Jericho knows how to bring the walls down of your addictions and your bad habits and the things you need to change this year. So God was saying, Joshua, I know the walls of Jericho look thick. I know the habit looks hard. I know the debt looks huge. I don't, I don't know what you're facing this year that you have to battle for a victory. But God says this in verse 2, see, I have delivered Jericho into your hands. If you're going to win this year, number one, it starts with surrender. Number two, you've got to see. See what God sees. See God's victory in that area in your life. See a vision of victory over that thing that you've been battling against. God wants you to see what's possible. He wants you to see yourself the way he sees you. He sees you as fearfully and wonderfully made. We will never rise above the image we have in our minds of ourselves. So if you think that you're a loser, you live like a loser. But if you start thinking, I'm more than a conqueror, greater is he that's inside me. The reason David fought against Goliath is because David saw in himself a bigger man than the man that was in front of him. You won't face the giants if you think you're too small. The Israelites, they ran from Goliath, but David ran towards Goliath. Why? Because he saw things differently than they saw. You'll never rise above the image of, the, of, of who you see inside of you. We've got to see God for who he is. We've got to see ourselves for who we are in God's eyes. We've got to see the potential that God has put inside of us. Proverbs 29, 18 says, without a vision, people perish. My dad used to walk me and my brother John and my sisters, Ruthie and Sarah, on this land that you're sitting in right now. This used to be a soccer field just 16 years ago. This was a soccer field, and it would get flooded during uh, the, the rainstorms that would come through Oklahoma. And I remember coming out here playing in the puddles, playing soccer. And, and, and sometimes when it rained really hard, we would you know, all run out here and just get soaking wet in all the puddles of, of rain. Before that, it was a cow pasture 30 years ago. But my dad, he would walk out on this field, and he would say, what do you see? And I'd say, I see puddles. I see ant hills. I see Walmart shopping carts that people left over here in the field. I see trash. And he'd say, oh, I see a hospital for the hurting. I see a future auditorium. You see, Victory didn't have our own main auditorium. We rented the Maybe Center for 20 plus years. And we would meet in our school gymnasium. But my dad saw something before anyone else saw it. You got to see it in here before you see it out there. And he would talk about what he saw, the vision that was inside him. Now he gets to see from heaven what God's doing. He would begin to describe, one day I see people filling up this auditorium. I see people coming back to Jesus. I see people hungry on a Sunday morning for the word of God, leaning in, lifting their hands, worshiping. The vision he saw before he died is the vision he gets to see in heaven of his son and his family carrying on the legacy. And this morning, as we were raising our hands and we were worshiping, we were standing in the full fulfillment of a man's vision. Proverbs 29, 18 says, without a vision, people live without boundaries. When I don't have a vision for my health, I eat whatever I want to eat. I drink whatever I want to drink. When I don't have a vision for my finances, I spend whatever I want to spend. And I get another credit card and another credit card because without a vision, people cast off restraint. When I have a vision, I have boundaries. I go, no, no, my vision this year is to pay off debt. If that's my vision, then I can't start spending on all these credit cards. 
and I might have to get a second job. But it's all because I have a vision. The vision drives my behavior. Your vision drives you towards your victory. So if you have a vision this year of getting healthier, all of a sudden you start going, I gotta go to the gym. I can't eat that extra Big Mac. I can't, I can't you know, supersize the McDonald's fries. I'm gonna have to go for something healthier. But because a vision creates boundaries for your life. A vision creates something to aim for and it starts changing. If you're gonna win this year, you gotta surrender and you gotta see where God wants to take you. Everybody say, see it. Yeah. Habakkuk 2 verse two says, don't just see the vision, write the vision down. You can't take ground on vision you haven't written down. Research shows those who write out their vision are three times more likely to accomplish it than those who don't. I like to look at my goals. I write them in my journal. I'll write them in my laptop, put them on my phone notes. I'll go back over them. This year, I wanna write a certain amount of songs. This year, I wanna write a book. This year, I wanna accomplish these things. This year, I'm praying for these things. I wanna see that vision over and over. Sometimes I'll put it on my mirror. So I look at it when I'm in the restroom. I look at it, not, not in the, you know what I'm saying. When I go into, you, you know, like on the mirror. And then, and then in the car, I wanna see the vision. Why? Because when the vision's in front of me, it drives my behavior to move in the direction of my vision. What is your Jericho? What is the place that God's called you to take this year? What's the ground God's called you to walk towards this year? And what are the walls that stand between you and Jericho? Maybe the wall is your ego. Maybe it's your pride. Maybe the reason you haven't broke that addiction is because you're too prideful to go to rehab. You're too big for it. But I'm telling you, once you get to a place where you say, I'm gonna do whatever it takes to get healthy this year. I'm gonna do whatever it takes to break some bad habits this year. I'm gonna do whatever it takes. When you get a vision and you are passionate about it, all of a sudden, pride, the walls start to come down and Jericho becomes yours. Number three, serve. The Lord said to Joshua, see, I have delivered Jericho into your hands along with its king and its fighting men. March around the city. So now God is giving Joshua a commandment. He's saying this vision won't come easy. It's gonna require work. But Joshua had already decided, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Come on, say it with me. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua had already decided in his heart he was gonna serve God's purpose. That Joshua knew no matter what's going on in the nation, no matter what's going on in the world, God is the one that I'm going to serve. His ways, his will, his kingdom, his, his promises, that's what I'm going to do. So God was calling Joshua to serve. And if you're too big to serve, you're too small to lead. I, I remember when I was in, in um, middle school and I told my dad, I said, I wanna be a leader. I wanna be a great leader. I was reading John Maxwell leadership books. And he said, you wanna be a leader? I said, yeah. And he said, be a servant. I said, but how, how does being a servant make me a leader? He said, because the best leaders are servants. Look for a need and meet it. Look for a hurt and heal it. Look for a gap and fill in. I would come to my dad with a list of suggestions for the church, you know, because he's the pastor. And I'd say, let me tell you some suggestions, some things to work on, dad. All right. You need to hire a new baseball coach. You need to, <laughs> you need to fix this. This water fountain over here, the children's church line, way too long. Well, it's way too, we're waiting for like 20 minutes to get our kids into children. Let me tell you some more things. Uh, the youth group, you know, we need this. And the walls are messed over here. I'm telling them, I've got a list of suggestions for pastor, daddy. Dad, here's what you, and he goes, all right, for every suggestion you give, I, I, I'll only listen to it if you're going to be the one that serves to make that suggestion happen. And I would stop talking. <laughs> Don't give me a suggestion, son, unless you're gonna serve to make it happen. A lot of people wanna critique. We got a lot of Monday morning quarterback, you know, those people just wanna call and tell you what you should have done watching the football game. Here's what you should have done, coach. But listen, God's not looking for critics. He's looking for contributors. He's looking for people who will say, I will serve in my generation. I will serve in my church. I will serve at my company. I will serve in my neighborhood. I'm not waiting for the White House to fix my nation. I will be a part of serving to bring the solutions to my neighborhood. Those are the kind of people who change the world. Servant leaders. Jesus said, I too did not come to be served. I came to serve. And if you are wise, you will do likewise. If we want to be more like Jesus, we serve. There's only, listen, Joshua was only able to take Jericho because he had the heart of a servant. He was taking Jericho and all of the promised land, not for him, but for all the other people. 
He was going to help other people have land that they did not fight for, they didn't work for, they didn't earn, they didn't pay it. But Joshua said, don't worry, we're gonna serve. We'll make sure everyone has a home. So Joshua did exactly as God asked him to do. In Exodus 17, verse eight, there's this moment where Moses was leading the Israelites into a battle. And he said, Joshua, I need you to fight. And Joshua said, I'm here. I'm here to serve you. God had told Joshua, you serve Moses until it's your turn to lead the people. You never waste your time serving another man's vision. While you're waiting to fulfill your vision, get behind someone else's vision. You never lose when you help other people win. So Joshua said, I'll, I'll fight. And Moses said, I'm gonna serve you while you serve me. We're gonna do this together because we're all part of the serve team. Turn to someone next and say, we're all part of the serve team. That's right. We're all part of the serve team. So Moses said, I need your help, Joshua. You fight, I'll stand up on the hill and I'll hold my hands up and I'll cheer you on as you're fighting. And the Bible says that as long as Moses' hands were held up in verse 11, as long as his hands were up, the Israelites would win. As long as their hands, were, there's something powerful about hands raised in worship. It's just a winning posture. Go ahead, just lift your hands up for a second. When y'all raise your hands during worship, oh my goodness, it is powerful. I'm telling you, demons tremble. As long as the hands are raised, we're winning. There's power when we raise our hands. It's, it's not just a sign of surrender, it's a sign of victory. It's a sign of victory. I love watching like a national championship game, whether it's, you know, Super Bowls coming up or basketball championships, whatever the game is. At the end of the game, the team that wins, they raise their hands in victory. The fans raise their hands in victory as if, as if they're all celebrating. We did it. We did it together. We're the champions. We are the champions, my friend, you know, and, and it's like people are pumped. Moses was raising his hands because he knew that's where the victory's at. But then he got tired. His hands grew tired in verse 12. I need, I need some help just for a second. Uh, Yvonne, will you come up here? Daniel, come up here. Drew, come up here. These guys are just amazing, mighty men in the church, serving behind the scenes. A lot of stuff that you see that happens at Victory happens because of Drew Bontrager, Yvonne Karamoko, Daniel Henshaw over here. We can't do it without the team that serves behind the scenes. And, uh, and, and I need your help just for a second. It says they put a stone underneath Moses and he sat there and then one got on one side and raised his arm, and the other got on the other side, Daniel, will you hold the mic? And when Moses' hands got tired, let my hands get tired for a second, they would come and lift his hands back up. When his hands got tired, they come and lift his hands back up. And I'm telling you, this is a sign right here of servanthood, is coming alongside of someone and saying, how can I lift your hands? Mom, how can I lift your hands? You want me to do the dishes on Sunday afternoon? I'm giving you guys some practical steps right here. <laughs> Honey, how can I lift your hands? How can I give you a break? People are tired. There's a lot of Moseses out there, right on your row. They're trying their best, but their hands get tired. I think sometimes people fall into temptation, not because they crave sin, but because they're tired. And when you see a leader that's tired, it's not a time to criticize. It's not a time to go, oh, I hope somebody helps them. No, you come in there and you say, how can I lift your hands? Because we need you. We don't need another leader to fall. We need you. How can I come and help you? When my mom was leading the church, when my mom was leading the church, and I might need your help, yeah, come, come like my, my hand, hand, my hand, yeah, my hand. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> We're gonna get it, there we go. A little awkward, but it works. Um, my mom, she was pastor in our church between 2009 and 2014 for five years, and I heard God speak it to me, not, not loud, not audibly, just in my heart. Whatever your mom needs, just say yes. Serve your mom. Serve your mom. And the day will come where you will serve the church as pastor. But while she's serving the church as pastor, you just come alongside her and lift her hand. So she would call me sometimes late at night to talk through things. There would be times where she'd say, I, I just need your help to, to preach this weekend. I need your help with this. I need you to lead a meeting for me. I need you to, and I'd have a full schedule. I mean like packed full but I'd heard, I'd heard God say, your job is not to make your mom accommodate your schedule. Your job is to lift her hands. So whatever you need to rearrange to go and serve, go do. And I would call people and I'd just say, hey, I, I gotta help my mom. I gotta help her on things. But as I did that, you never waste your time serving someone else's vision. 
When you do that, I'm telling you, you never lose when you help other people win. And not only that, I, there's, been, there's been people who've come and helped Ashley and I with the kids. There's been people who said, you know, we've been dreaming one day of having children. Right now we can't have it. Doctors have said it's impossible. But instead of getting angry about not being able to fulfill our vision, we wanna help you with your kids. We wanna watch your kids. How can we lift your hands up this week? Man, in tears, and the joy that they get to receive of being part of that. They say, no, it's, it's not a struggle, it's a joy to get to do this. Joshua found joy serving Moses. Aaron and her found joy serving, and vice versa. And I'm telling you, there is so much more life. You get a living by what you make, but you make a life by what you give. When we give to others, it, it fills us with more energy, more excitement, more hope to be a part of serving the vision of the house. Give these guys a big hand, thank you. I want the keys to come out. Seven ways to win. Number one, surrender. Number two, see. Number three, serve. Number four, speak. God told Joshua, tell the army of Israel what I tell you. In other words, speak what I speak. Say what I say. This is a year that we need to get our words in alignment with God's word. Say what God says over yourself. We, we, we oftentimes critique ourselves so much. I, I, I'm not the best at this. I'm getting better. I'm speaking it over me. I'm getting better with my words. But sometimes I'll beat myself up. I'm a, I'm a critic of myself. Oh, you should have done this. You should have said that. You shouldn't have said that. You should have done this. And, and, and so often we're beating ourselves up with our words. Oh, you, why did you say that? Oh, it's so stupid. You know, and it's like we're so mean to ourselves. And in order for us to have a victory this year, we've got to start speaking life over ourselves. Lord, I thank you that I have the mind of Christ. God, I thank you that I'm more than a conqueror. God, I thank you, Lord, that I'm forgiven. Lord, I thank you that I'm no longer a slave to fear. God, I thank you I'm a child of God. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. I'm not ugly. God, I thank you, Lord, I'm your child. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Lord, I thank you that I'm anointed. I say that as I go in to preach because I don't always feel it. But you know, you can correct your feelings. You can correct your feelings. Some of us are camped out on a channel of defeat, and so we just keep on listening to that same voice of defeat. You loser, discouraged, nobody cares about you, you rejected, and we just keep on playing those words. I remember I drove up here on a Saturday night in 2012, and I had to preach that Saturday night, and no one was here. And I was so discouraged, I'm crying. I'm like, no one wants to hear me preach. I don't even wanna hear me preach. God, you don't wanna hear me preach. The demons don't want to hear me. Nobody wants, not even, you know, I'm just like Eeyore off Winnie the Pooh. Like, nobody invites me to their birthday. I'm so lonely. Nobody cares about me. And I was sitting in the parking lot, and God said, change the narrative. Change that narrator's voice in your head. You've been talking so defeated over yourself. And I was saying, I just miss my dad. and People miss my dad. And if he was here preaching, people would come and People don't want to hear me. And I, I was so defeated. And God said, change the narrative. When I say God said, again, it wasn't written in the sky. It wasn't loud. It was just in my heart. It was like I was reminded as a kid, the scriptures my parents taught me. The Bible says, train your children up in the way they should go. And they will not depart from it. They might forget for a second, but they'll remember. They'll remember those scriptures. That's why it's so important getting your kids in children's church, getting your teenagers at Victory Youth Group, signing them up for Victory Youth Fest, getting them in the presence of God, getting them around people of God, getting them in the word of God. All of a sudden, I started remembering, I can't talk like this if I want to walk in victory. You can't talk in defeat and expect to walk in victory. You can't live a positive life with a negative mouth. If you're going to win this year, you've got you to win in your mouth. It starts on the inside, and it starts right here. The promises of God are voice activated. Hey, Siri. You know what I'm saying? We talk to our phones, and our phones respond because they're voice activated. Siri's listening to you right now, even when you're not talking to her. The FBI, Facebook, they're all watching. <laughs> I cancel you, Instagram, in Jesus' name. I cancel. <laughs> I rebuke you, Facebook, in Jesus' name. No, I'm kidding. Oh, snap. They're going to cancel me now. They're listening to it. I cancel the cancel culture. I cancel all the canceling. <laughs> Come on, how many of you are just done with cancel culture? Like, let's just be done with that ridiculous stuff. <laughs> but but the, the word of God is voice activated. So God's like, if you just say it, 
I can do it. If you just start speaking, talk yourself into victory. So I remember sitting in, in the parking lot that Saturday night and I had a napkin and a pen and I just wrote down, I'm here on purpose. And I stopped and I was like, God, I don't feel like I'm here on purpose. I feel like I'm here on accident. I feel like everything bad that's happened, it's just been an accident. It's just been so, like there's no purpose to any of this. And God said, no, no, you're here on purpose. You may not feel like you're here on purpose, but you're here on purpose because you have a purpose. And then I wrote down, my heart is open. My heart was not open. My heart was Jericho. The walls were built up around my heart. Depression, fear, anger, all of it. It was just built up around my heart, but I, I had to confess it. I had to talk my heart into being open. I don't know who broke your heart last year. I don't know who left you. I don't know who betrayed you. And it's so hard for you to trust or be open to God. But I'm telling you, you can talk your heart into being open. That's why we say it every week. My heart is open. We got to confess that. I said, Lord, my heart is open. My mind is ready to receive because God is not finished with me yet. Now, I had been saying for a while, God, I feel like you're done. I feel like you're done with victory. You're done with me. And, and I was canceling God's plans with my words. And God said, stop canceling what I want to do. I'm not finished with you. I'm not finished with your family. I'm not finished with your church. Look today. This room is full. And, and, and listen, I, I never would have imagined this room would be full in 2012. I was so defeated in my head. I was so discouraged. And yet God is so faithful. He's so faithful. I'm going to cry just looking out at you. Because sometimes I feel like I'm still preaching to that Saturday night room. And then I look up and I go, oh, it's changed. There's people here now. <laughs> but I began to just speak that, that napkin. That was my napkin confession. My best days are right in front of me. I kept that napkin in my wallet for a couple of years until it was just settled in my head. And every week we say that victory confession. It wasn't written when I was on the mountaintop. It was written when I was in the valley. And that's, that's where you got to get the confession of faith. Say what God says. Joshua told the Israelites, Jericho is ours. It may look impossible, but God did not bring us this far for us to lose. He did not bring us this far for us to be defeated. Just because there's a new king in Jericho, just because things look different, God has a plan for your life, and he's not finished. Number five, surround God told Joshua, tell the Israelites, march around the city. Surround your dream. Surround your goal. Hit it from every angle. Walk around it. Look at every brick. Study every part of how this, this Jericho miracle is. It, it, listen, God wants you to circle your dreams. Circle your prayers. But here's the twist. Who you surround yourself with determines whether you ever conquer your surroundings. So God told Joshua, surround yourself with fighting men. Surround yourself with people who are on the same mission as you. As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. I wouldn't be where I am today if it wasn't for the six guys I meet with regularly every week. We have a text thread. We text each other. We pray for each other. We're vulnerable with each other. We invite each other into our prayers, into the things that we're believing God for victory in. You cannot win without relationships. We've got to have a team. In fact, the military, there's a term in the military called paraclete. And it basically means a team of people who have each other's backs. They fight back to back. They serve, they honor, they help each other through the thick and the thin. It's the band of brothers as they stick together, whether, whether it was World War II or whatever war it was in, the paraclete, these group, this group of soldiers, they would walk together. They would look out for each other. They would help each other. They would stand beside each other. This is what we need in the church. This is not a time to get divided. A divided world needs a united church. In order to be united, you're going to have to get relationships in your life. Some of us in this room, we have been quarantining. We've been self-isolating. And Proverbs 18 verse 1 says, a man who isolates himself is a man who's headed towards destruction. When you feel like doing fellowship the least is when you need it the most. We've got to come back to that place of community. 
Who you surround yourself with determines whether you ever conquer your surroundings. Your crew determines your view. This is not a year to fight alone. Whatever battle you're fighting, whatever addiction you need to break, pull in some girls with you. Pull in some guys with you. Pull in a connect group with you. Whatever things you need to work on this year, invite relationships to be a part of it. In order to have relationships, you've got to be relational. You've got to take that effort. This is why we do victory groups. We're giving you, we're, we're, li we're literally throwing the ball in front of the bat just so you can hit a home run this year. We want to help you have relationships this year. Get in our men's and women's discipleship class. You might say, well, Paul, I go to church. Isn't that enough? That's great. But you need someone in this church to know your name and you need to know their name. And you say, well, okay, I got that. Good. Turn it into a group. Turn it into a group. Meet once a month. Go to McAllister's, go to Zio's, go to Quiznos, if there still is a Quiznos. Go to Qdoba, go to CeCe's Pizza, or Hideaway, or Salvestano's, wherever you wanna go. Go, 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 go hang out with those people. Meet up together. How you doing? How you doing on that weight loss goal? How you doing on that health goal? How you doing reading the Bible this year? Listen, I grow when I have people checking up on me and that I'm checking up on them. How can I pray for you right now? What's going on in your life? You know, I think about how in, in Acts 14, Paul the Apostle, it says a group of guys came and they tried to attack Paul and they threw stones at him and they beat him and they left him for dead. It says in verse 19, they assumed he was dead. So here's Paul. He's laying on the ground in a fetal position like a possum. He's just pretending to be dead. But he really was dying. And in verse 20, it says, a group of believers gathered around him. I need like 10 people. Run up here real quick and just circle me. Just form a circle around me. And it says, as they surrounded Paul, as they surrounded the guy, this is what we do when a Christian falls down. We don't kick him. We surround her. We surround them. We surround him. And in that circle of protection where we say, we're going to help you get back up. We're going to restore our brother. We're going to restore our sister. As they surrounded Paul and they prayed for him, a world that's full of canceling each other is going to be changed by a church that surrounds each other and prays and lifts up and forgives and loves and restores. And the Bible says that as they surrounded him, Paul got back up. This is how we win our battles. Surround each other. Now let's form this circle and face outward and lock arms. How many of you guys remember that movie that came out like 20 years ago called Gladiator? Y'all remember that? Are you not entertained? I've always wanted to say that on a Sunday morning in church. Are you not entertained? Maximus Aurelius or is it Marcus Aurelius? One of those. Maximus. There's this moment in the movie where the evil emperor wants to kill him. He recognizes who this guy is. He's been trying to kill him the whole movie. And at the end of the movie, he says, oh, we're going to loose out all the lions. He's in the arena. Everybody's watching. And there's like four prisoners. And, and, and Maximus is one of the prisoners. And they're all fighting by themselves. And all of a sudden, he pulls in his guys and he says, hey, listen, we're better together than we are fighting these battles by ourselves. And it says they got tight and they locked arms in that movie. And they begin to move. Yeah, move. Move this way. And every time someone came to attack, they'd move together and they overtook those who were trying to overtake them because they moved as a community together. There's power. Come on. There's power in who you surround. Your Give these guys a big hand. There's power in surrounding yourself with believers. And I'm telling you, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. Don't surround yourself with people who aren't going in the same direction as you. Get, get surrounded by people who are aiming for victory in their life. Aiming for victory. This is a good group of people right here to be surrounded with. Number six, start moving. Start moving. The difference between a dream and an accomplished goal is a due date. Put it on the calendar. Tell yourself, by March 16th, I will have this done. Or I will at least write one chapter. Or I will at least read the Old Testament. I will read the book of Psalms or Proverbs by February 14th, Valentine's Day. Whatever it is, put a due date on it. Start moving. Stop procrastinating. I'm telling you, the enemy to your success is procrastination. One of these days, I'll get around to it. 
I'm going to get around to it. I'm going to get around to it. Stop saying you're going to get around to it and start moving on it. Our potential is the gift that God has given us. But our gift back to God is what we do with that potential. I remember meeting with Miles Monroe the year before he died on a plane crash. And Miles said this. He said, Paul, the richest place in the world is the graveyard. Because in the graveyard are buried books that should have been written, buried businesses that should have been started, buried inventions that people were too afraid to launch. They just kept procrastinating, buried dreams and goals and schools that should have been launched, hospitals that should have been built, dream centers. There's so much that's in that graveyard because people died with a life of procrastination, just kept putting it off, putting it off, putting it off. One of these days, one of these days, I'll be a giver. One of these days, I'm going to write a big check. One of these days, I'm going to pay for the dream center pool. One of these days. What if this year you started moving towards the dream and the goal you've been saying one of these days you're going to do? What if this year you did it? The walls of Jericho come as you start moving step by step. Number seven. Here's the final point right here. Stick to it. Joshua told the Israelites, God spoke to me. Jericho is ours, but we got to march and we got to march. Not just one day, not just two days. But three days, four days, five days, six days, everybody say, keep on marching. I think we stop short of a miracle because we get frustrated with how long it takes. We get frustrated with the process. We think, ah, Paul, I've been trying to go to the gym and I don't see any progress. I don't see any muscles. I haven't seen a change. Paul, I've been tithing and my finances still haven't changed. Paul, I've been spanking my kids and they still talk back to me. Paul, I've been telling my husband this. I've been telling my wife this. Paul, I've been praying for a wife. I've been praying. I've been single for so long. I've been waiting to have children for so long and it's not happening. And I just hear God saying, stick to it. Don't stop. Don't stop. There was years that we were waiting for you to come to this church. I would stand in the top of section C and pray one of these days on a Sunday morning, there's going to be people sitting up here. It didn't happen until this last year. For six years, I would circle this room and I'd say on a normal Sunday morning service, when it's not Easter or Christmas, there's going to be someone sitting in the top of section C up there. I see you raise your hand way up in the back row back there in section C. I prayed for you. I circled that chair. I was waiting for you to come. But what would have happened if I said, it's not happening, God. I've been praying for this miracle for three years, four years, five years. This year, my sister Sarah is about to have a baby. And listen, that is a baby that God has promised her and Caleb. They've been praying for that. That baby is a miracle. God has a miracle for you. But you got to keep on believing. Keep on stepping. Stick to it. Stick to it, pastors. Stick to it, dads. Stick to it, moms. Stick to it, college students. How many are believing God to pay off debt this year? You want to be debt free. How many have been chipping away at it for a while? You've been waiting for a while. How many have been waiting to get married for a little while? You've been waiting. Just look around. Look at, look at who's raising their hand. Just scope out the territory. Where's your Jericho at? Make sure you break down the walls between you and him, you and her. How many have been waiting on something to happen? You've been waiting on, you've been circling this thing. I'm telling you, this could be the year that you see that dream fulfilled. Why not get your hopes up? Why not move forward with faith? There was a girl in our church this last year. She was in a desperate place for a miracle, her and her husband, her whole family. And I want to end today with you seeing this video because it's, it's so powerful. Don't miss this. This is such a powerful story, testimony of a girl and a family who did not give up praying, sticking to the dream in their hearts for her healing and her testimony. Check this out. August 4th was teacher orientation, so Ashley came to school and I was awoken to a phone call saying that she had been found unresponsive and was being rushed to the hospital. I met her in the ER, they did a CT scan, found that she had what's known as a saddle clot or a major blood clot clogging her pulmonary artery. I walk into the waiting room as I hear code blue, which is somebody's coded on the table, and I just I thought, please don't let it be Ashley. In that moment, it's just that fear and that raw emotion of not knowing what to do or being helpless takes over. They expected us to say goodbye.
She coded for roughly 10 minutes and they ended up bringing her back. They told us that she had less than a 5% chance of waking up, period. And if she did wake up, that she was gonna be a vegetable for the rest of her life. Pastor Paul came up and met with us that first day after we had gotten the news that they didn't expect her to wake up. And we asked him, how do you stay faithful, but yet prepare yourself for an outcome of this kind? At the end of the day, you just have to trust. We chose to surround her in prayer. So we called on Victor and we called on our prayer networks to just start praying and to start standing with us as we waited to see. From that point on, everything was a whirlwind of progress. The day that we got her shifted from the vent tube to the trach tube, she woke up. When that moment happened, it was just a celebration in the room. We didn't care if that was all we got. Our Ashley was back and we were gonna work with the rest. That following Sunday, about day five of her being in the hospital, Pastor Paul was praying over her in church. I got a text from her husband tonight during service, and he said, tonight, as Darius was preaching, Ashley started roaring. She lifted her hands up to praise God. That Thursday when Darius Daniels was speaking was the first day that Ashley had truly returned to us. And we had no words because up to this point, we had had no action out of her. And the first day she's fully awake, she's worshiping. She was listening to the sermon with Darius Daniels and roaring when he would say to. The amount of progress that they were seeing left the doctors baffled. The neuro came in and explained it to us that of the brain, there's two parts to it, the gray matter or the cortex. The gray matter can heal itself. The cortex damage to it is permanent. All of her damage was to the cortex. And here we are less than two or three months later and all of the damage is gone. The doctor had no words to describe how that's possible other than saying that there's a greater physician at work. They had told us that she had less than a 5% chance of waking up and she walked out of the hospital on her own in roughly two weeks. On the one month mark of her actually having the incident, she was strong enough to not only come up and see her students, but to walk across the building to see them, to come and stand in front of them and declare that she was healed and coming back to the classroom. I would just thank Victory, Victory Christian School, Victory Church, Pastor Paul and Ashley, everybody for praying. It was just amazing to see how much this community came together for me community victory, they prayed without ceasing. I am the living proof, literally, that miracles do happen. They are possible. God is still on the throne. He's still working. And I've had so many people reach out and even say, your story has brought my faith back. My name is John. My name is Ashley. And this is Victor. Come on, church, stand to your feet. What a powerful testimony. You know, as we get ready to worship just in these last few minutes, I believe the same miracle God did for Ashley, the same way that God moved in a supernatural way, God wants to move in your life. And as I was watching Ashley in that hospital bed, looking dead, I was thinking about people in the room today who might feel dead. You might feel like a dream is dead. You might feel like you, you could never accomplish certain things. Maybe you feel like something's out of reach and addiction's too big for you to conquer. A relationship is too messed up for you to get healed this year. But I believe we serve a God who does the miraculous. And God is good. He's faithful. He's on the throne. And this year, He wants you to win. He wants you to win in your finances. He wants you to win in your health. He wants you to win in your relationships. He wants you to win spiritually, most of all. He wants you to have a year of victory, not a year of defeat. And I'm just gonna ask you all across this room, if you would close your eyes, respect what God's doing, no one moving. But if you're here today and you say, Paul, that's me. This, that's me. I need to see a victory in my life this year. There's some things that I need to conquer this year. Just raise your hand. God's speaking to you. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah, all over this room. Could be a physical thing, could be a spiritual thing, relational, financial. But today, you're, you're getting your faith built up. Maybe you're here today and you say, Paul, I just need to surrender to God. I need to get my eyes, my heart fixed back on God. I need to come back to a place of relationship with God. If that's you, raise your hand today. If you raise your hand for either of those, I'm gonna ask you to take a step of faith. And I want you to leave your seat. Come and meet me at this altar right here, right now. Just leave your whole row as you come down. And we're gonna cheer on brave men, brave women. Brave girls, brave boys, brave parents, husbands, wives, grandpas, grandmas, whatever generation you are. 
And let's fix our hearts this morning. Let's just begin to worship that God is never going to let us down, that God is faithful, that God's going to help us see the victory this year. Yeah, let's go ahead. Let's worship. Come on, get your hope and your faith in God's power. Get your peace, get your joy, get your vision back. Get your mind back. Get your heart beating again. You're never gonna let me down. Maybe you wanna come down to the altar with your whole family, with your friends, with your spouse, with your roommate. You're never gonna let me down, God. Victory, victory in Jesus' name. Victory in Jesus' name. Victory in Jesus' name. Victory in Jesus' name. Victory, peace, joy, freedom, freedom, life, healing in Jesus' name. Healing in the mind, the heart, the body, God. Lord, I thank you. This is a year, God, that you're going to propel them towards their destiny. the mind of Christ. Jesus, 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 Jesus. He's still good. He's still able to do the impossible. He's still faithful. Victory, God. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. The battle belongs to the Lord. Come on, He's fighting for you. He's going ahead of you. Walls are gonna fall. Walls are gonna fall. Strongholds are gonna fall.
got the victory in Jesus. Lord, I thank you that you give life and life more abundantly. You've given me joy. You're causing my heart to beat again, causing my mind to think clear again. I can see, I can see what you see, and it's victory. No more defeat, no more defeat. Help me to see what you see. Help me to say what you say. Help me to do what you've called me to do, Lord. I just believe that God's causing some of you who've been waiting for clarity this year that this week he's giving you clarity on goals, dreams, vision for the year. For some, it's been, it's, you've been waiting for a long time. It's been kind of hazy. It's like you've been in a fog and God's saying, I'm clearing up the fog this week and I'm gonna help you to see what I see, that God has a future and a hope for you and his plans are to help you, to prosper, to give you the help you need to walk in victory. And I also see God says, I'm coming beside you where you've cried and you've cried and you've, you've sowed in tears, but you're going to reap with shouts of joy. You're going to come out with a harvest this year of joy for all the tears that you've wept, for all of the pain that you've walked through, for all of the sorrow that you've endured. Though weeping may last for the night, his joy comes in the morning. God says, I'm going to give you a garment of praise for that spirit of heaviness that you've been walking through. And I'm going to bring you into a lighter place, a brighter space. You're going to be able to see things clear this year. Lord, I just pray right now for every person here. I pray, God, even just right now over my heart, I pray over every heart here and those that are watching online, God, that this would be a year for victory in their life. This would be a year that they don't just circle Jericho, but God, they take that Jericho. They, they see that dream fulfilled. They see that goal accomplished. They see the victory in that area in their life they've been praying for. God, I thank you, Lord, that as we apply your word, God, as we lean in and as we meditate on it and as we apply it in our lives, God, that we would see fruit. God, that we would see the beauty of just consistently doing what you've called us to do over time. God, that consistency brings the breakthrough consistency, God, in the word, consistency, God, and just coming to church, praying, just like going to the gym. God, we're going to see the changes over time. Help us to stick with it in Jesus name. Just pray this with me. Say, Jesus, I'm all yours. I surrender to you. Your kingdom come, your will be done in my life as it is in heaven. I trust in you. You are my Lord and savior. I repent of sin. I receive your forgiveness. And I thank you that my best days are right here in front of me and that I have victory in my life because you live in me, Jesus. Amen and amen. Come on, give God praise. Thank you for lingering longer in his presence today. I love you. God bless you.